Hello, and welcome to 80s TV Ladies. I'm Sharon Johnson. And I'm Susan Lambert Haddam. Let's get started. We are so joyful to be continuing our deep dive into Cagney and Lacey, the female driven buddy police show that ran from 1982 to 1988. And it proved that women could be buddies under pressure. A few episodes ago, we talked to the creator, Barney Rosenzweig, then Tyne Daly, and now the incredible 80s TV lady, Christine Cagney herself, actress Sharon Glass. Miss Glass is a multi-Emmy and Golden Globe winning screen and stage actress. She may be best known for her role as Cagney in the 80s TV ladies phenomenal show, Cagney and Lacey, but she also played the title role in The Trials of Rosie O'Neill. She also played the dirty mouth loving mom to a gay son, Debbie Novotny, for five years in the daring American version of Queer as Folk on Showtime. And then a tougher but still loving mother, Madeline Weston, on Burn Notice. As the last contract player at Universal Studios, Gless also guest starred and co-starred in many of TV's top rated series of the 70s and 80s, including The Rockford Files, The Bob Newhart Show, Marcus Welby, M.D., House Calls, and Switch. Miss Gless has also starred on the stage in major theatrical productions, including Misery, Chapter 2, and Round-Heeled Woman. And she is an author as well. Gless's award-winning autobiography, Apparently There Were Complaints, was published by Simon & Schuster in December 2021. Apple Audiobooks named it a must-listen. Publishers Weekly called Gless a masterful storyteller. And I call it a fantastically fun read. She's been married to Barney Rosenzweig, the executive producer of Cagney and Lacey, and a guest of this show since 1991. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much for joining us at 80s TV Ladies. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and for asking me. How are you doing today? Doing very well. I'm very happy. I've been looking forward to doing this with you. And um, um, I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm, I'm physically well, and um, I've had a wonderful career and intend to continue to do so. Somebody did an article on me. You know, I've been doing this book and I'm doing interviews and this man interviewed me and he said, do you know that you've done more television series? You've done nine television series. You and Cloris Leachman, the only two women who do nine. I said, wow, I didn't know that. And uh, he said, yeah, the only person who beat you was Betty White. Of He's course. done 10. <laughs> He's done 10. I said, well, I'm going to have to meet and match Betty. <laughs> well, Betty has gone to the great you know, MCA in the sky. Um, but I still have one more in me. So I don't intend to beat Betty, but I'd like to match her. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would like to see that. But if I had to beat Betty, that means the next one I tried wouldn't work. Right? And then I'd have to do another one. <laughs> so I'm happy to just match her. You don't want to jinx anything. No. That actually it, brings me to a question, actually, I had. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like moving to Florida has really not had an impact on your ability to continue working in television and, and working in general. Is that correct? Correct. I've been very blessed. I, I moved to uh, Florida because that's where my husband wanted to go. He wanted to retire, and he had a belief that you cannot retire from Hollywood and live in Hollywood. So... Um, Okay, so we moved to Florida, and he's very, very happy. And I'm married to a man, she's happy, everybody's happy. You I thought of it. Um, and, but whenever I have got an opportunity to work, he's the first feminist I ever met. So since I moved to Florida, I think I've done three series. So I was just free to go and travel and be and just continue to be an actress, regardless of where I did. Right. But I want to go back to uh, the first feminist you ever met. Was it really Barney? He's Barney Rosenstein. Barney approached me to do this series called Cagney and Lacey. And I didn't realize he was a feminist. Uh, my background was I'd been under contract to Universal for many years, 10 years. And in that day and age, even though Gloria Steinem had been out there swinging that bat, you know, I was not made politically aware. 
I was not aware of all the work that Gloria was doing while I was under contract to Universal. And when Barney asked me to do this series, uh, I didn't want to do it. Not because it was two women. I didn't want to do another cop show. Um, anyway, he's hiring me to do Katie and Lacey. I started learning. I didn't realize the impact that this show was having. I knew it was about two women. I'd never starred in a show with a woman before. It had always been with men. And what I was trying to see is I never felt uh, there was nobody I was in competition with. I didn't have that drive red fight, fight for the female because I was like the only female. I was the only one wearing a dress. So I always thought I got what I needed and what I wanted. It never occurred to me to ask what the men were making at Universal. But it wasn't until I joined Cagney and Lacey and I became aware of really what a shitty deal we were getting. Again, I was raised only with brothers. I don't know how to explain that I was a newcomer in uh, fighting for women's rights. But once I hooked on to Cagney and Lacey and I met this Barney Rosen Swag, who was the first feminist I'd ever met, I learned and I had the great pleasure and the great honor to play Chris Cagney and to change lives for other women. Believe me, ladies, I did not know I was doing that when I was shooting Cagney and Lacey. But you were. Apparently it was. But do you know, I didn't have the, first of all, the ego to assume I was changing women's lives. Um, I was just doing a really cool character. Probably, I still think, you don't mind me saying, um, I still think Christine Cagney's one of the great characters ever, female characters ever written for television because she was so flawed. And so flawed. So, and had so many layers and flawed at a time, again, that women just weren't given that many layers. Mm -hmm. No. No, I mean, I, I, I left it. I had, I had never been offended by any role I'd been given to play. I never felt any of the women I played were less than, were treated less than, were boring, were not interesting. But my mind wasn't like that. I wasn't in the fighting mode when I first became an actress. I was just so grateful to be working. I'd do anything they'd give me. And I succeeded because I had a very powerful woman behind me. My name James, yes. who was the head of talent at Universal Studios. The reason for my success is a woman. And the reason for my, the longevity of my career is because of a man in Barty Wilson's way. But who put me on that map was a woman who was the first female vice president of MCA. And she saw something in me. She believed in me. I was green. I didn't know anything except that I knew I wanted to be an actress. And she believed me. Monique James' background was that she and her business partner, Eleanor Kilgallen, uh, were the first females to have a talent agency in New York City. And their first clients were Grace Kelly and Warren Beatty. Hi. <laughs> Wow. These women, they were young girls and they started their own talent agency and they had these two really cool actors and uh, Lou Wasserman, uh, he headed MCA, he decided to buy Universal. So, I mean, he couldn't be an agent with MCA anymore. Um, and Lou Wasserman bought out Minnie James and her partner. Okay. It's the first women ever to have a talent agency. So Monique James and Eleanor Kilgallen became the first two female vice presidents of MCA. Huge, huge. huge. Then MCA bought Universal Studios and agents were no longer allowed at MCA to function as agents. The, the um, government came and locked all their, their files because you couldn't own a studio and also use your clients. Mm -hmm. Right. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So... Money James and Albert Gallon became the first two female vice presidents of MCA Universal. Monique was head of talent on the West Coast. Eleanor was head of talent on the East Coast. That's amazing. Yeah. 
And Eleanor also had the Toronto and England as her markets to pick young actors. But when he picked me, and um, I know I'm talking too much for you. No, this is really fascinating because we we don't talk about these women that were so groundbreaking enough. That's one of the reasons we started the show. And so I'm very curious about Monique. Thank you, because you wouldn't want to sit here and talk to me because I'd have nothing to tell you if it had not been for her. And you were how old when you, and you were the last contract player at Universal? Very last one to leave the lot. Yeah, I was, uh, they signed me when I was 26. And they made me lie about my age. I have one of these Irish monks. I was never a great beauty, but I passed as a kid, you know. And um, so she said, don't tell anybody. You know, older. I said, okay. So I worked for 10 years and she groomed me and I learned everything she taught me. I know it's in the book, but I'm repeating it because it's every year show. When you're a contract player, you're taken into a screening room, a big screening room, the days when they had huge screens. Young people great to know what that means, you know, but they had big, huge, enormous screens and you'd be forced to sit there and watch your film. And she talked to some man. It's like kind of a movie. She talked to some man in, in the projection room and say, please run Miss Glesson's film. Or it's got to be Miss Gless in front of me, you know. Um, I mean, in front of other people, she'd call me Miss Gless. Um, and he'd run my film and I'd have to look at it. And she'd tell me what I was doing wrong. And she taught me how to do this thing called acting. That is amazing. That is so hard for actors to watch themselves, I think, often. I happen to be an actor who never watches herself. I never watch myself. But you were forced to early on. <laughs> I had to because mm -hmm. one of my obligations and to learn from her. You know, it's something, even a simple the first time she said, see that thing you're doing with your mouth? I said, yes. She says, stop doing it. <laughs> I mean, you know, start out that and simply. Um, and then she started teaching me to listen. She said, you're not listening. She said, you're waiting to say your line. I said, yeah, I am waiting to say my line. She said, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Sharon, if you learn to really listen, listen to your, your fellow partner. Listen to what he's saying. Your face will change because your face does that. And your face will change as you're listening. And they're going to cut to you instead of the person who's talking. And the truth is, that's when acting became fun for me. I started relaxing, really listening to what somebody was saying. And they'd either, what they said may hurt me, or they may make me laugh or anything. I was able to drop the, the, the fear as long as I was locked into that fellow actor. So, sorry. No, it's fantastic. Do you know if there were any other actors before you that she kind of took under her wing a little bit and helped them make the transition that she helped you make to understanding, you know, how to basically act on film the the way that she taught you? Well, I know Susan Clark. I don't know if you remember Susan Clark. Yes. Was very big in those days. And um, she was just a theater actress, darling. And much more training obviously than I ever had and she was the all. But Monique believed in her, saw her, and I don't know if Monique trained her, because I think she came in trained. You know? But, but isn't isn't theater acting different in, in a lot of ways than film acting in terms of, you know Well, I always joke in theater acting you talk louder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess there is. I mean, Ty Daly, primarily, was her background is theater and her father's, and she went into the family business. She went into acting because her parents were actors. Um, and I think Ty considers herself a theater actor. If I had to discern where I excel, I still would call myself a film actor. It's a different skill, or it's... Uh, or they liked me better on film than they did on the stage. You know, there's just a place where you land. And as long as somebody will listen to me or cry or laugh or I make them feel, 
whatever avenue that is, I'd love to do it. I think that's really not good. In your question. Mm-hmm. No, you Brain are. Is a very skilled film, uh, stage actor, and that is her first love. I, however skilled I may be, I, I'm more comfortable in front of the camera. One camera, I don't like those four cameras it comes. Oh, interesting. I, I like my relationship with the lens. Oh, that's really... I like, and it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that Monique James, in the article I read about her, is also credited with discovering Robert Redford, Sharon. Other Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sharon's. How did you know that? That's I what mean, it was in uh, an obituary that I read about her. That they said credited with discovering you, Robert Redford, and Warren Beatty. They called her the star maker. Yes, she was very formidable. She frightened me, but she was wonderful. I I loved her dearly. And so she was your boss. At she was my boss. She was my boss at Universal. She's the reason I had a chance to go to Universal. But then when my time was up at Universal, they were closing the contract system. And I was the last one to leave. And they, of course, asked her to stay on at, at Universal and do some other executive job. And she said she wanted to leave and become my manager. And so she left. Universal MCA, she left to manage me. That's, that's a pretty big investment. That's a pretty big honor. And I was our only guy. Wow. I bet you, you both were very formidable. Walking into a room. <laughs> oh, I never felt I was far little, but she was scary. <laughs> it was. I, I, I never thought of myself as far um, I I'd like someone to see me, me that, maybe that way in a, in a character or something, but I don't think socially I'm ever vulnerable. I'm shy. You never know it by how much I'm talking, <laughs> but I am shy. So your last show under the contract was House Calls. It was. Thank you. It was so nice to uh, very adept interviewers actually do their homework. You know, move that we have such a good time. Anyway, thank you. Um, yes, I left after house calls. The studio system ended after I'd been there 10 years. All the actors left. And they held me back. Monique said, why are you doing this? Let her go. You know, she could make some money. This Laura Dojo making it studio. And they said, because we want her to, to uh, do house calls to replace Lynn Redgrave. Can you imagine? And Monique said, well, then make her a contract, make her a, a, a series deal instead of an exclusive contract where you should make a little dough. So they said, all right. So, and, and I stayed at Universal, but I stepped into um, house calls with Wayne Rogers. And um, trying to replace Lynn Redgrave, if you can imagine. I yes, you talk about that in your book, and it's a it's some great stories. Uh, that section of the book, yeah. yes, great stories you. throughout the book. Yes, really great stories. But in any event, yeah, the contract system is has always been very interesting and intriguing. And on some level, I I'm not sure if they had the option if the studios wouldn't want to have it back because of the financial constraints that it provides to them, but. I think it's expensive for studios because we got paid every week, whether we worked or not. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, I was paid $186 a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have paid them. I would have. People would say to me, don't sign that contract to Universal. You'll never be heard from again. I said, nobody's ever heard me now. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> and it yeah, did the right thing. Being a contract player had its drawbacks. Uh, the producers on the lot resented hiring contract players. They had uh, some sweet blonde off the lot that they wanted to come in and play the role. But they were, shall we say, encouraged to read the contract players, you know? Mm-hmm. That's a Monique James line. They were encouraged to see us. They did not have to hire us. The only thing we got is we got the sides, meaning that scene, the night before. So we could rehearse it the night before instead of walking in and doing what used to be called a cold reading. Where you're handed the script and you were given like 10 or 15 minutes to look at it. And then you go in and you read for it. Well, as a contract player... She'd get it to my house 
Oh, all the country players got the scene sent to their house the night before. So you had to prep. But that was that was sort of the only advantage. Except you got to hang out at the Westmore makeup building and Edith Head had her own design studio there. So you wow. surrounded uh, with the best, the best in business. It doesn't mean you got to hang with them, but you were surrounded by them. You could see them across the commissary. Yes. Yes. And Edith Head once stressed me. <gasps> Ooh. I was just going to ask you that. Tell us about that. Yes, That's please. Melissa <laughs> jumping in. <laughs> she can't help herself. <laughs> it's only because of Monique James. I, every contract player on the lot got to be in Airport 75. Oh, wow. And the reason we got to be in Airport 75 were stewards or stewardesses. And they just paid, if we worked, we got to pay, make $206 a week. But we were never allowed to speak. If we spoke, then they'd have to, you know, give us more. But every contract player was made a steward or a stewardess in Airport 75, <laughs> given our little pittance. We didn't care. I started a, a, a monogamy game on the, on the set because I'd never done a feature before. It takes five hours to light a scene, you know? Television, it's fast, but in features, it's huge. So I started this monopoly game going, and um, Edith Head did the um, stewardesses' outfits. And apparently, Monique had gone to Edith and said, Edith, look, I've got someone who's one of the stewardesses, just do something to make her look a little different. So we all showed up in front of Edith Head with... Um, like camel colored A line skirts, camel colored heels, beige hose, um, burgundy turtleneck sweaters, and a scarf around our neck. Fairy stewardess, right? And she looked at all of us and she said, Sharon Glass. I said, Yes, Miss Head. She said, Come with me. <laughs> <laughs> she took me back to the dressing room. And she said, that, take off that skirt. Okay. I took it off. And she had trousers, the exact same color, same gabardine, same everything. She said, put these trousers on. Okay. She said, all right, I like it. Uh, she said, take that thing off around your neck. I said, okay. And she said, pull your hair back in a ponytail. They need to your neck. Get the hair off your face. I said, okay. And she says, let me wrap this around your back. So I ended up being in trousers, no blonde hair hanging down, just pulled back with that scarf, no silly scarf around my neck. I was very tailored, which is really was my style, but she saw it. And all she did was do that swisheroo, and I'm, it was the only stewardess who looked like that. That's amazing. I, wow. I love Monique for doing that. I love her, you know. I know, and then she asked them, if I could have a close-up with Karen Black, who was the female lead of the show. And um, so I had a close-up, a two-shot with her. So embarrassing. Anyway, but I just stood there looking stupid. And then I got a job while I was on that movie. Many had had me reading for a miniseries, and I got it. And I got the miniseries after four readings, and I got a miniseries called um, is it Centennial. I was going to ask if it was Centennial. Mm. Centennial, right. Yes. A period piece. Yeah, because uh, we also spoke with Stephanie Zimbalist, and she was in Centennial. Oh, no. It wasn't Centennial, but of course she was in Centennial. No, it was um, The Immigrants, and I was the female lead. So that must have been one of your breakout roles then. It was. It was. And Stephen Mock, who played The Immigrant, uh, it ended up being my lover on Cagney many, many years later. I love how many people have worked on Cagney and Lacey. Mm -hmm. Like. Almost everybody that we talked to uh, or we're looking at to talk to have done something on Cagney and Lacey because it ran for so long and in particular had a lot of uh, uh, ladies up in the uh, writing and directing. So I will shout out Barney for that. Yes, yeah, we had a female director. We had Karen. You're going to be talking to Karen, right? Yes. Karen Arthur. Yeah, I'll tell you the numbers. Do you want to know the numbers on Cagney and Lacey? Because we like to do the numbers on the shows we cover and how many um, uh, women were sort of behind the camera. Yes. And Cagney and Lacey is, by the way, off the charts. We've only looked at really closely at three shows uh, so far. 
But out of 42 directors listed on IMDb, 13 were female directors. That's 31%. It's way higher than anybody else in the 80s, as far as I, as we know so far. Like, significant. So, shout out to Barney and, and the whole team yeah, for that. You did, it. you did it. As I say, I wasn't... I gained all the, the knowledge and the experience and all the things I didn't know about feminism because of that show. I was exposed to that that fight which women had to do. I was so protected at Universal. I never starred with another woman. I learned nothing about the female struggle in our industry and in the world until I did Kagi and Lacey. And so what was there a moment? Was there a moment whether you were doing publicity or someone came up to you or during the show that you went? Did somebody told you this story? No. About me politically and publicity? No. Okay, I'm going to give you a story. Oh, fantastic. My publicist on Cagney and Lacey uh, was a wonderful woman named Pat Kingsley. And Pat said, um, Sharon, now we're going to be doing um, public service announcements uh, for you to encourage women to uh, register to vote. I said, great. I said, I should really get registered. Um, <laughs> I swear to God, and here's time has been out there, you know. I'm a direction. Barney sits to Pat. I think Sharon, Barney's series, I think Sharon is interested in getting more politically involved. <laughs> said, that means she's considering getting registered. <laughs> I'm so ashamed to tell these stories, but I have come a long way. It it was not handed to women. I was raised by a mom who worked and, you know, she was a single mom of two daughters and she was a scientist. She worked for CDC in Atlanta. And that was like, she never talked about it. She wouldn't have called herself a feminist, but my sister and I both grew up going, like knowing about it. And then from my sister, who was older than me, that she, she, she trained me up pretty quick too because she was off to college before me and it was the time of Gloria Steinem and and it was out there but I think unless you had a world in which you're watching your mom not be able to buy a house even though she has a great job because the bank wouldn't loan her money I was like that doesn't seem right you're like you're just like hmm hmm <laughs> but I think unless you had an excuse or reason or were growing up in that and handed that a lot of women weren't handed that. No. Weren't handed that they had, that they were up against a wall. They just didn't know it. Yeah. Um, I think I had a credit card when most women didn't have a credit card because they, your husband could have a credit card. Yeah. But I had a credit card, I think, long before most women did. I don't know how I got them because I, I didn't get married till I was 50. There were just all kinds of things I took for granted. I didn't know how bad it was until I was lucky enough to get Cagney and Lacey. I'm so blessed. And I didn't even know, I'll tell you the story of me being a book, but Tide and I uh, were invited to march on Washington during the young Bush. And there we were in the front row carrying the banner with thousands of thousands of women behind us. And Whoopi Goldberg was there and Gloria Steinem. We were in the front row carrying this thing and, maybe hundreds of thousands of women and maybe five men. One of them was Barney Rosen's wife. Anyway, we were taken on this stage. It's the stage where far, far away is the Washington Monument. Okay, mm -hmm. That's where we were. I didn't have any idea what we were doing or the impact that Cagney and Lacey had had is really what I'm trying to say to you. And uh, Gloria came to me and said, go out there. I said, go out there. I look at time to tell you. She said, go out there, Sharon. I said, what do I say? You know, my dialogue had not been written for me. What do I say? She said, just go out there. Time, go there. So if I remember, I walked out to this. And time followed me. They were crazy. They started screaming and clapping and 
tens of thousands of them. And I didn't know why. And it was because of what we had done. And I didn't know, I didn't know the impact we were having. I got it then. I got it then. We didn't have mics, so I just waved. Said thank you. You know, we were off stage and everything, but I hope you understand the moment I'm describing to you. I do. You're making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's it's a it's a everybody's used to having access to everything now. And then it was not Yeah, but I didn't know. Yeah. There, you they were working yeah. about us. Yeah. You were working how many hours a week and you know, how many weeks a year trying making this television show and there was no social media, there was no internet. It's totally understandable. And I didn't even yeah. know I, how could I say to them, thank you. I didn't have Mike. But Gloria, you know, she knew exactly what she was doing. And um I didn't I'm surprised they recognized this. <laughs> and then Bernard walked out on this stage with I mean, people were miles back at the Washington Monument, you know, like like it, like it was the, the president inauguration. I mean, it was, anyway, that was the way I learned that we had impact. I was given the gift of playing that part. And uh, the whole time I was doing it, I never knew that I was giving a gift I was just lucky. I knew I was giving the gift of it's okay to say you're an alcoholic. It's okay to run. I knew that was a rough one. And no one had ever done that before. No female had ever done that before right. uh, in character. And then me in real life. Um, but then, I don't even know how I got on this except... Well, we were, yeah, we were talking about was there a moment? And I think that was the moment where you went, oh, I'm I'm doing more than just playing a character on a TV show. Did you end up carrying that back to the show with you? Like, did you feel like, oh boy, we better be careful now? <laughs> like, I don't know if you felt that responsibility in the when you were doing it, or were you able to set that aside? I always felt your responsibility as an actor. You did the finest job I could. I didn't. I wasn't. I never carried the responsibility of I have to represent women properly. Um, I guess through my performance, I did. She was a difficult character. She, you know. I mean, Mary Beth Lacey, you know, roll down her sleeves and straighten her bow and everything. She'd go see the lieutenant. And I'm sorry, she, whatever. Cagney always had this <laughs> act. You know? she, would, she had Dre. She was going to be the first female uh, police commissioner. And, and she didn't follow the rules. And um, But no, I never knew that I was giving women permission to do the same thing. Yeah. Go get a job where there are no women, if that's what you want. Because there were no women in the police business when Tide and I were in it. No partners ever, never female partners. Yeah, and, and no female work friendship on television. No! Like that was, that, and even now it's rare. We were talking about the show, like, you know, obviously Rizzo and Isles and, and, and shows that are, kind of clearly following in the footsteps. There's also friendship shows, Sex and the City, things like that now. But at the same time, it was so that I do remember, you know, watching it and just the normalcy of two women having a conversation about both work and their personal feelings about that work. Right. Susan, um, Carrie and Lacey were not friends. Mm hmm. They were not friends. They could have been more socially different. Caddy didn't got children. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Mary had her husband, her children. Kathy, Kathy was sleeping around. And Kathy, uh, Kathy was ambitious. Mary Beth wasn't ambitious. She she wanted to put in her 20 and get the retirement fund to help her family. That's who she was. She was a great cop. Mary Beth Lacey was. But they were never friends. But their lives depended on each other. Their lives depended on each other. They were partners. But they were never friends. They didn't socialize with each other. She'd be so bored going over there and pretending she was playing with the children. 
she did it sometimes, Katie, but um, Barney used to say, in a fairer world, those two women could have worked at the post office. Yeah. Didn't matter because they, they were never, they weren't pals. They, they, he said the police situation was better because their lives were at stake. It was more interesting. Yeah, more dramatic. Immediately but dramatic. They weren't pals. Now, Ty Daly and I today are best friends. We weren't when we were shooting the show, not because we didn't love each other and more so respect each other. Um, but we didn't have time to be pals. There was no time. It was a lot of long hours. You, you know, horse around after work. She had children she was trying to raise, and she'd be getting home at midnight, you know? Mm -hmm. But we, we loved, we, we supported each other. Yeah. You were partners. We were catty stuff. A lot of the press tried to say, oh, they're so catty, you know, they don't get along. It's totally <laughs> good. And we're much better friends today. Yes. She said that you were competitive with her. I am? For what? For coming on. She's, when I said you were coming on the show, she said she's so competitive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm equally happy to be invited. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're very happy to have you. And, and I love that. Again, Sharon and I have been friends for a long time. <laughs> Melissa and I have been friends for a long time. And that ability to be able to sort of work with your friends and create with your friends is pretty special. But one of the things, you know, I think I got subliminally more than with direct knowledge at the time and watching Cagney and Lacey and is the idea that these were two professional women. They were two very different people. But it showed that you could be, you didn't have to be a certain way to do this job. You had, you didn't have to be a certain type of woman to be a police officer or to be a feminist. It just had to do with, are you competent? Can you get the job done? And it's something I, to this day, really appreciate about the show. You, Jared, I don't remember our ever discussing feminism on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was not part of our, what we talked about. I guess we were showing, hey, it can be done. It can happen. Come on. Yeah. And we never talked about, I don't ever remember even talking about, uh, oh, the guys are getting better than we are. And we didn't pound that stick. We just did it. There may have been some, some areas where it's sort of, for lack of a better word, indirectly infiltrated into the storytelling. I'm thinking in particular about the episode where there was another cop who was um, physically abusing his wife. And the two of you were like, mm, do we bring this up? Because it was more, but it was more about we're all cops and do we, how do we deal with that? Because that's sensitive as opposed to, I think anything else initially, but the goal for the two of you was always find the person who committed the crime and see to it that the justice system punishes them. That's what your goal was. And we can do it. Mm -hmm. And to depend on these guys. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And we can do it. Yeah. Um, it, we, it, it was all getting the job. I'm sure time brought that up because that's the only place we could as two women talk alone because mm -hmm. we were minority. Yeah. And I love it was so interesting how they brought you on the show. And if we can talk about it, you came on, you were the third Cagney. I don't know if you felt yes. pressure or what you felt. Well, I was asked first. So yes. that sort of gave me a little bit of an ego about it. Um, and I, of course, turned it down. Um, and Barney, as Barney said, actors are not always the best judges of material. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it went to uh, the writer's suite. And then um, it went to um, a series at the time Loretta did it. And Loretta had to go back to MASH. So Barney approached me again. And I couldn't do it because I was going to do house calls. So Loretta came in and did it. I, Meg Foster came in and did it uh, for the show. Yeah, Meg Foster. Yes, yes Meg right. Foster, a wonderful, wonderful actress, came in and did it. And the network didn't care for the parry. Thought there wasn't enough contrast. So Maid sadly was replaced because time loved Maid. So you can imagine, here I come, the third Cagney, and Barney invites me again. And um, do you know this story? 
Marge and Mr. by going to New York to find out if house calls. Was- he did tell that story. He told the story that he knew. And I felt like it was such a producer moment. Like, a, like it, a, was. it was. Such a produ- <laughs> I know I have a piece of information that I get to I know. pull out. <laughs> I was in house calls, right? So we fly to New York. Yes. To find out if house calls is on the schedule for the next year. He finds out it isn't. So he calls my manager. She says, I'm sorry, Barney, dear. I told you, Sharon's in house calls. And he said, that means he's in house calls. He's got her inspired. So. <laughs> that, is such a, that is such a producer moment. I, I, know, that, like, I, I have a piece of information and I'm going to yeah. use it to get what I want. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it did all work out, finally. Time came right to this house. I invited her because we had billing we had to talk about um and that's a nuts story but um and we sat right in this house and she brought champagne and um we agreed we really liked each other like one another we worked out the building and the rest is history i was very fortunate and very blessed to work with her and i i do love that the episode that you know the the first episode of the second season where it's it's the two of you it's a big conflict. Like you start right off in in conflict a little bit as as Mary Beth and Christine, because you're. I think it's the one where where there's been a, a shooting and whether which of you saw a gun, or if you're going to back up another cop. And it was just so interesting yes. that it was such a great way, but it felt like the deep end. Felt like you guys jumped into the deep end of those characters and that show. Right. That scene is used quite often to talk about the series. The scene of um, where Mary Beth and I fight. He says, I saw what I saw, and you jumped, you started, and yeah. I remember now. I wanted her to back me up. Yeah. And it's such, again, it's so amazing. First, as just your, like, sort of your first episode it wasn't like oh we'll just be solving a crime together (laughs) it was it was very character driven it was very much about the two of your relationship and it was also allowing women to be mad at each other in a very real way allowing women to be mad and angry and express that anger and then also find ground like you know kind of rebuild the relationship within that show right it doesn't seem like it should be groundbreaking but i could not point you to a, a, another show of that time that truly did that in comedies there'd be a lot of you know like golden girls sure. had a lot of conflict and then resolution but really really they did it yeah yes, they did. but mm-hmm. in terms of drama did, did barney ever um talk to you about how cagney sort of came to be born uh, in character no, because I challenged something. Oh, well, you write a little bit in your book when you realized who Cagney was, but but tell the story. I don't. Well, know. we were in our boss's office with all the men, with all the the, the male um, cops, also all our people in our precinct, and I can't remember what why we were in there, but Mary Beth, I said, always oh, buttoned up. World Tetter season is always very proper. And um, she says, Lieutenant, if you don't know the difference between rape and romance, she, he was talking about um, Gone with the Wind. Yes. And, and, and I think you guys were working on a rape case or something in the. Right. Yeah. Right. And he was saying, but in Gone with the Wind, you know, he carries her up. Well, he did rape her. He did rape her. But it was made to me very sexy. You yes. know, which now we she wakes up that exploring with a smile on her face. Um, Anyway, Mary Beth Lacey's line is, well, Lieutenant, if you don't know the difference between rape and romance, you better problem. She walks out, and that's very unlike Mary Beth. So, as it's written, everything's quiet. Oh, as it's written, one of the guys, probably is Becky, and what is it with her? Time of the month or something? And I stop the scene. And the director says, what's wrong? I said, I need a line. I need a line, guys. I mean, he doesn't get to say that. It's our partner. So we're never allowed to change a line. So they call Barney Rose and swank down and said, Barney always looked at his watch, always said, what seems to be the problem? 
So is what seems to be the problem. I said, I need a line. I need a line here. Is Becky just said about Mary Beth's, what is it? Her time of the month or something? I said, I need to get a better line to get back at it. He said, no, you don't get any line at all. I said, I don't anybody. He said, you're Cagney. I said, no, I'm Cagney. He said, come over. Patient me aside. He said, this is a lesson for you, learning the character you are playing. She doesn't give a shit about defending her partner. She's one of the boys. She plays poker with him at night. She wants to be one of the boys, and she's going to swallow it. She's going to let them say that about her partner and not open her mouth. And I remember I said, oh, I get it. She's a coos, isn't she? That's another word for I said, she's a coos, isn't she? And I smiled. At least I understood. And he said, she got it. That's who she is. She loves her partner. She wants to be one of the boys. Because she wants to be lieutenant. Yeah. So she was worried to betray her own sex to stay in the, you know, the poker game. I mean, I've kept my mouth, I kept my mouth shut in the 80s as a young person in the work environment. Did you? I, I don't know if I did. I, I, I'm sure I did. I didn't, I didn't have, I wasn't part of, I was very gratefully may I say, I was never part of the Me Too. I never had that problem. Now that men didn't find me attractive. Um, or they didn't hit on me because I, I had many Janes right there in her office. And I have told. Um, or they didn't have anything I needed. Mm. There was nothing they had I wanted. And I think they knew that. So I never had that unfortunate time in my career where I got hit on and my, my career threatened if I didn't play. Yeah. So but write my book, perhaps I just wasn't very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think you were being protected by Monique. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. No one dare. Yeah. In your book also, you would, I, if I'm remembering correctly, you mentioned that when you were cast as Cagney, that, that you and Tyne spent some time together working on your dynamic between the two of you, working on, um, you know, separate from, from when you're on stage, working some things out that way. Um, I just wondered if you might expand on that a little bit. We did. The, the day before we read together with the, with the cast, very, very first time I had ever stepped in to play this role, and there was a reader in front of the cinematographer, in front of some of the key crew, in front of, of course, all the cast, and executives from Orion. I mean, oh God, because this is the last chance, right? Tyne calls me up. She said, what do you say we run this script alone together before they ever see us do it? I said, great. Do you mind? She said, no. So she comes over with a bottle of champagne again. And uh, we run together. It turned out five times we did it together. I'm so grateful to her. Because when you're the new person, you don't hate to, you don't want to bother anybody. Um, so we went and we did sat at the table with all these people, you know, and we did it. And Barney stood up and said, and ladies and gentlemen, that's how it's done. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> it makes me cry because time came up with just the, the very, the necessity, of course, of us doing it together and not arriving green. You know, she had the advantage of playing this character for quite a while, but she knew I had not. Yeah. And yeah. And what you might be referring to also, Sharon, is that our working together every night at mm -hmm. shoot, we met in my trailer because I had the bar open. <laughs> So we met in my trailer and read the next days were over and over and over again until we thought each other's rhythms. That's fantastic. And that pays off in the show. It's so, there's so, there really is such a, a camaraderie that comes across in the show. It, it really does feel like you guys are working partners because you were. We were. And I, I will always say, certainly I have my own skill. i Certainly, I brought something to that character that they didn't have before. But Time Daily 
Here's the reason. Time is such a generous actor. Such a generous actor. Anything I wanted to do. She didn't care. And she just pawned, you know? And we were kind of a hoot together. Yeah, I I can imagine. I well, I think we, we we are already planning to basically have you back on the show together because that's my <laughs> goal. <laughs> I just want to have cards with her. I had a birthday poker game last night. Oh, nice! Well, your birthday, happy birthday! No, I'm saying my birthday was the last day of no. May, but I like to play with my fr- some friends and my stepdaughters in times always included. So, games our game last night. Oh, that's great! I lost. Oh, you lost. <laughs> All right. And so did time. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So there you go. See, that's okay. Um, I'm curious if Christine Cagney would have called herself a feminist. In those very early days? I Yes, I think she would have. But I don't think she would have understood the real meaning of a feminist. I think she was a feminist for herself. She wasn't going to let anybody say, because she's a girl, she can't add. But was she a feminist to fight for other women? No. I think at that time, Cagney would fought for herself. I think she was a blowhard. I think she, I tell in the book um, a story, but I'm going to tell it to you too. But I went to time when I first took over this character, and I totally was getting who she was. Who I thought she was. And I said to Ty, and I have something to ask of you. She said, well, I missed it. Sure. And they said, we're always running indoors, you know, with guns drawn. I said, can I run in before you? She said, you know why I want to say no to this question. So, of course I do. So, I'm asking it. I said, Tyne, I think Mary Beth has a lot to lose. She has a husband. She has children. This one doesn't give a shit about anybody. She wants to be the hot shot. That's who she is. And sometimes it's twofold. And I don't think she's as cautious. She wants to win. And tried to listen to me. And she said, I get it. If that's what you need. I said, I don't mean every time, but most of the time, our routine. She said, okay. Well, guess who won all the Emmys? Time to leave it. You know, that, that show lives or dies on that relationship, mm-hmm. and that's why it lives so long yes. and, and so long in our hearts. I, you know, I have, I'm not wearing it today, but I have a Cagney and Lacey shirt because I like, I have shirts of all the shows and, I was in the grocery store the other day and wearing it and three different people came up to me and they're just like, Oh, I love that show. Oh, Cagney and Lacey. Oh, (laughs) it has so much resonance. That show people do remember it. I want to take a break real quick. We'll come right back and we'll, we won't do all our questions because I'm not sure we'll be able to get through them all, but we'll, I don't want to do it. Embarrass myself. Like Barney did do four hours. I mean, come (laughs) on. Barney was very sweet. He was very sweet. He loves it. Are you kidding? He loves it. It was fascinating. It was fascinating and interesting and fun. We'll come right back. Hello. Welcome back. Carol King did the theme song for the trials of Rosie O'Neill. In, and then you tr- had her on the show in the gr- in a great episode. The well, reunion she, episode. In the song. Her manager at the time did not want her to sing on TV. Um, so um, we got wonderful. Um, Melissa Gail. Manchester? Manchester. Oh, there you go. Thank All you. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I got to go the day that there was... Carol King and Melissa Manchester together. Wow. And singing, and she's singing the song Carol's watching, of course, because it's her song. And Melissa's singing it beautifully, and I'm just watching. And then they took a picture of the three of us together, which was cool to me. Um, yes, Carol wrote the song Barney Approached Her and asked her if she should write the main, the main theme for the trials of Rosie and Neil. And she said she'd love to. And then he asked her if she'd sing it, and she told me that her manager did not want her singing anything for a TV series. Um, I think she felt very apologetic about it. So we got 
um, Melissa Manchester. But on the show, Carol told Barney that she's always wanted to act. So Carol did come and perform as a character on our show. And um, it was a reunion of everybody in my, was it college or high school? High remember? school. High school. High school, right. And um, Carol was one of, you know, our, our besties, our bestest friends. And Tyne arrives also as one of our high school alumni. Uh, and she's a, a Tony winner from Broadway. And Tyne had just won her Tony. On Broadway. So she played it to the hilt. And She's very diva in that episode. <laughs> oh, very diva, exactly. <laughs> it makes everybody hate her. And um, But we have a wonderful scene together at the end where the characters settle in each other. But to sit there and sing with Carol King while she's playing on the piano, her song, and she's singing it worse than, you know, the graduates are singing it with her. You know, sometimes she just take things for granted when they're happening. I know it's a rare key. Highlight in my life. It was a beautiful, uh, that episode was really great and it was a beautiful scene and um, and I it took me forever to recognize Gretchen Corbett. I never know. Gretchen was a contract player with me. Oh, was she? Okay. All right. So I have questions. A lot of these questions are from my husband because <laughs> he's a huge Rockford Files fan and wow. thus a huge uh, Gretchen Corbett fan. And he's a television writer wow. and producer. And I, I literally took a picture of the reunion scene uh, and sent it to him. Oh, Carol's down there. Oh, Carol's yeah. down there. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Well, and, and I said, okay, you have to pick out who all these people are. <laughs> And he could, he recognized everybody but Gretchen Corbett. And I said, and when I said uh, it was Gretchen uh, Corbett, he was like, I don't believe that. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't look yeah, right. but we're in a contract together. And she did like a recurring role on uh, Rockford. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. And you were on Rockford. You did two episodes of Rockford Files. Yeah. And one was playing a stewardess. That's it was great. Called, it was called The Fourth Man. I don't remember. That was my first one. Was where I think I was playing the stewardess. And um, I'm excited about it um, because it was written by Juanita Bartlett. Who is, I knew Juanita. Can you please tell us about Juanita Bartlett? I don't know who she is now. I, she moved she, to Carmel. She passed away an, yes. a, a number of years ago. But She uh, moved to Carmel. I know that. And sort of retired there. Yes. But she didn't. She write with that was that wonderful writer. She she wrote on the Rockford Files for many years, and she was right. a producer and writer on um, Scarecrow Mrs. King, one of the other shows that we cover from the eighties. Stephen Cannell, yes, not Stephen Cannell. Uh, Stephen Cannell, David Chase, yes, Stephen Bochco, Stephen Cannell. For all of them. In fact, Stephen Cannell used to call me his good luck charm. He put me in all his pilots. Oh, small part. One, I did a pilot for him where I was like one of the leads. Um, and then he put me in that Baba Black Sheep where it was, gave me one scene in his pilot and it sold, not because of me, but he just thought, you're going to be my good luck charm. I'm always going to put you, do a little something in my pilots. That was the Black Sheep Squadron. squadron. Yes. I used to yeah, that's good. You really know your stuff. Oh, we grew up on television. Watched a lot of TV. Yeah, so I watched a lot of TV. TV. <laughs> yeah. I remember that act. I don't remember his name, but he used to do... Robert Conrad. Robert Conrad Con used to do Conrad. those battery commercials. The battery commercials. <laughs> Knocked yeah, it off my shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, all those guys... But they were all around in, in Winita Bartlett's. Yeah. We were all a universal. That's Stephen, Stephen, um, Stephen Bochco eventually left Universal um, and went on to, you know, greatness. But um, Stephen uh, Kettle, we sort of knew each other socially. We were both born in L.A. He was a native Angelino, just like I was from Pasadena. And I was from Hancock Park and... He died way too young. Yeah. Anyway. His daughter makes a, a television. I believe she's a director, some kind of television creator. Right. Yeah. That's right. I believe I worked with her. I think Barney hired her 
maybe it wasn't Barney, maybe it was on like, um, there was one of my other series after that, and she came and directed us. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I do love, it, it does feel like uh, you guys are always inviting the family back. I believe Meg Foster does a, a guest on Trials of Rosie O'Neill. Yes, um, Bob had her be, often play my opposing attorney because he felt so badly at the networks, really forcing him to do that. Um, and he always loved her, you know. So, yeah, she came and, and did some wonderful turns for us on the Trials of Rosie O'Neill. Okay, I have a couple questions, just like about the opening sequence for Cagney and Lacey, in particular, the shot walking down the street, sidewalk in New York, of you yes. two together, that's so sort of iconic from the sh for the show. Just meant. And so you guys went to New York to sh shoot that. Right. Once a year, we would go to New York to um, shoot exteriors. And they were just cut into episodes. I mean, we'd shoot them speaking, you know, doing dialogue. And I said, well, wait a minute, what happened before this scene? Because, you know, an actor needs an antecedent event, so you know why you're crossing the street. So the writers would give us our scenes and then tell us just what happened just before that scene. So we, and we used to love going there. Uh, and we always went there in, I think, August. Hot, so hot. <laughs> We wore the, it like hot, you know, wore cool, cool clothes. We were walking down the street. Well, then you come to later on in the year and you do that scene that preceding it and you have to get back in those clothes. Well, we've been eating the craft service all year. And we couldn't get back into the clothes we'd established. <laughs> Every year we had this problem. So fun, they started putting us, even the heat of August and year, they'd put us in coats in half and stuff. So they, <laughs> we, we tried for us to duplicate that scene or walk, you know, we could take off that. We could have bigger yeah. clothes. That's so funny. Do you remember we're doing that, walking down that, that shot that's clearly a long lens? You're walking with real people, I assume? Yes, I did something that was not uh, in the script. We were not, I was told to do, but it just seemed right. We did many walking down the streets. And I decided, well, Cagney likes clothes. So, um, even though we're kind of managed clothes, but she liked to style, you know. And so I said, I'm going to go look and see what's in the window. So I just stopped. And time wondered, where'd she go? And without her ever planning this, and she goes, goes back and gets me and pulls me by the arm. <laughs> and then staying in is one of the parts of the main title. Oh, so that, great. I, I know exactly what you're shot you're talking about. That's so great. And then I, of course, have a question about the flasher. What was I saying? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like is really just get some a lip reader. <laughs> I'm serious. And figure out what you were, because you don't remember what you were saying. Well, I'm saying, because I've never been able to answer the question, but the attitude I can tell was really... Um, they're what we hope to do with that. <laughs> it's sort of, that was my intention. And I, I knew we weren't liked, so it didn't matter. Right. But what, I mean, again, that opening sequence, very, very lovely. And that flasher shot in particular has stayed with me from childhood <laughs> <laughs> because, right, of, because of your look, right? Because of, of your yeah. look. Thank you. Well, my goodness, thank you. And and thinking about it, it's actually a little surprising that CBS let you put that, let them put that in because it seems a little, uh, for lack of a better word, risque for a network television show to put that kind of shot in. But good kudos to them. They were they were uh, a little more lenient with us. Um, at one read through, Marty Cope had a. Can I say anything in order? Yeah, he didn't cut it out. Yeah. So when read through, and this is in the script, Marty Cove has a line like saying that, well, she's a, and I raised my hand. I said, excuse me, I mean, you know, excuse me, Marty, can we see on television? He said, no, but I'm going to trade it in for another word I do want to use. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's why he put it in the script, seems to be bushy. <laughs> Again, 
I mean, just a classic producer move, right? Yep, like I'm going to push it too far <laughs> and then I'll give you some ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. I won't say it. Then, yes. <laughs> um, I'm so I do also want to, I have questions about Queer as Folk and how you got involved with that. And again, it feels like a show that may have um, brought you to another level of awareness and activism, according to your book. Very much so. Um, Queer as Folk, I was in Chicago doing a play and my television career was slow. It was slowing down. I'd gotten very, very, very heavy. I'd hit like 200 pounds. And um, my marriage was falling apart. Because of that, um, this everything was falling apart. Anyway, so I was doing this play, then it had been written for me. So I thought, well, I'm not so busy. I'll go and do this play. Well, while I was there, I got an offer to do Lion in Winter back east in summer for a summer playhouse thing. Uh, so I hired the top drama coach in Chicago to train me. And the man who was my trainer was also an agent. And he called me one day and he said, do you know about Queer as Folk? And I said, no. He said, well, it's a British series and it's not been shown here. And there's a black market copy. Showtime, he said, has bought the rights to do the American version. And there's a black market copy going around. Really? He said, yeah. And there's a part that's perfect for you. Let me have a car, send it, or stay right where you are. And I said, okay. So I stayed in my little apartment, and um, the driver comes, kitchen strip, so I'm not so busy. I sit down and I read it. Well, I read that role of Debbie Novotny, and I, I knew, I knew this was my next show. If they take me, I knew I was perfect for her. Um, and I'd never been aggressive on my own behalf ever. So, I pick up the phone and I call um, Showtime, the network, because Barney's ex-assistant is now the assistant to the president of Showtime. So I say, Carol, Sharon, hi. I just read Queer as Folk, which you guys are making. I said, I want the part of the mother. Said, you don't want the part of the mother. There's another mother that is very young. And I said, I do. And it was, I just figured out that I was talking about Debbie, the body. I said, I do want the Barney Sharon. She said, you don't want to be in the show. It's in Canada. I said, perfect. Because Barney and I were going through the divorce, you know. Um, and, and she said, there's no money. I said, I don't care. I want it out. I want it out of the country. I wanted my own series again. I just wanted the things I loved, you know. So she said, well, let me run it by Jerry. They're doing casting today, at casting meetings, talking about Anyway, Jerry Offsay gets on the phone. He said, Sharon, Jerry Offsay, I like the idea. I said, oh, Jerry, I'm so glad. He said, yeah. He says, I think you'll bring a little class to the project. I said, Jerry, a class is not what I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you know the role of Debbie Devante, but she was not a classy woman. And so anyway, he flew me out to meet um, the two producers. He says, so I'm as far as I'm concerned, you have the job, but I don't want to run rough shot over my producers. Would you mind meeting them? We'll pay to fly you out. I said, not at all. So I flew out and I met them and it was the most fun meeting. We laughed the whole time and uh, they gave me the role in the room. That's and so read for it. I mean, I, I, I'm so happy because I knew, I knew I could bring something to it and I knew I was right for her. Um, I might... Debbie Novotny was kind of crude and crude looking with the red hair and the thing and the thing and the red wig. I mean, it was all, you know, in the, their earrings and, and I plead her with my mother's heart. And mother is the most, was the most refined woman. Absolutely. If you ever think of the word lady by mother, my mother never raised her books. Never. Said a swear word once she said D A M N. She spelled a swear word. And I said, But I know my mother's heart. And I totally played it with her heart. I allowed myself, I made up that look. 
because they didn't want to be the blonde, you know, the, the 200 pound blonde. What, a Cagney and Lacey gone? I mean, Christine Cagney gone bad. So I thought, well, now's my chance to be somebody else and look different and act different. And so that's a long answer to tell us about where it's up. It's a great answer. But I, I also learned so much. And I am one of these people who, like, my best friends are gay. But I, until Queer's Folk, I didn't know the real struggles, the hardship, the heartache, all of the stuff that you didn't hear about until that show. And I learned. I learned. And then boys would walk down the street and come over and say, may I have a hug? And they'd start crying. It just was um, a wonderful, I was able to have impact again, you know, a different kind of impact, but I was able to have impact on some people. You truly did. I, um, our marketing person who is not here today is Sullivan, and he um, is a, a young gay black man who watched your show and I mean, watched that show and was like, she was the mom that we all wanted. She yeah. was the mom we didn't really? have. She had such a mouth on her. And she, she slapped her son across the face. And but she loved and accepted him and exactly. everybody around him. George. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If anyone was going to hurt him, she was there. Yeah, I, I love the show, too. I mean, this this straight black woman absolutely loved the show. Um, loved Debbie. Loved how loving she was. Not just to her son, but all of his friends and and the whole community, and you were so wonderful in it. It was it was really great. Loved it. I lucked out. I just lucked out. Thank you so much because it was. Um, and sometimes it pays to raise your hand and say, "I want." I like that you know? part. Yeah, I know. I've never done that in my life. And there it was, and then it was a changed my life, brought me back. I mean, what a great yeah! You've made this is the third time. Sharon Glass made me cry three times today. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but for all the best all reasons. The best. Exactly. Thank exactly. you so much. It was, uh, I've stayed closest to that cast mm. than even Cagney and Lacey. Tyne and I are inseparable. But the rest of the cast, we worked so many hours, we didn't get a chance to know them or play with them. You know, we, mm -hmm. didn't, we didn't get a chance to hang out. And then Burn Notice, you'd play a completely different and yet adoring yeah. mom again. Mm -hmm. well, and you know, I want to say something. I never wanted to play the mother. Play the mother. <laughs> the eater, snore. Uh, <laughs> but these two particular mothers were fun. I refer to the mother in Burn Notice as the mother from hell. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. She, and Jeffrey Donovan and I got along so well. And... um it was just an end worked out. But anyway, they, we finally stopped divor divorce proceedings by, you know, way after Queer as Folk. Um, and then this uh, bird notice was in Miami, which is where I lived. And I didn't tell them I lived there because I have a home in LA. <laughs> because I wanted to, during the pilot, I wanted to hang out with the cast in the hotel, you know. And I wanted to get per diem. <laughs> it's sold like months later my manager called me and he said burn notice sold. i said what's burn notice <laughs> it was a very odd title you know so yes. i didn't it just didn't i didn't remember it i did one day's work two days work that was it and then i went home and then he calls me months later burn notice sold Ooh, now i have to tell him i live in miami Ooh. Because they're going to want to deliver the scripts and stuff to you. So I, I confess. You confessed and okay. you didn't get. Always. Uh, I said it fair. You didn't get a uh, per diem for the entire series? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I wanted to be to the pilot. You know, I just want to hang out with the actors in the hotel. None of us dead housing. Yeah. Well, I do. So. Um, Anyway, it was, it's been a wonderful, and I've stayed friends with that, those actors. And so I'm, I'd like, so you and Barney were at the brink of divorce for a while. Yeah. Very serious. Yeah. And then we just lived long enough to say, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very, very rough times. 
what is it? Eugenie Ross Lemmings said we had our own first character as a king and 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 she said oh my she's been had a writing partner her entire career Brad Buckner and she's like oh that that that's my best relationship my marriage is hard <laughs> <laughs> oh it is oh yeah hardest hardest relationships well obviously too it's much easier to, for me to play it as the character than play myself so you know when, when I'm playing in a series great they can't hurt me but he could and didn't i'm sure i did my share so now we've been married 31 years that's who'd have, amazing who'd have thunk never thunk it and you didn't think you'd ever be married never i never wanted to be married never ever um i'd never seen a good marriage still very few i don't know if it's a net if it's a natural state but I was single for so many years. I didn't get married until I was just about to turn 50. And I, I liked me, you know. I got along fine with me. But I got married at almost 50, and then I went into menopause. Well, poor thing, poor Barney. He didn't know it in her. <laughs> None of us do. <laughs> really. <laughs> you lay a lot of stuff bare in your book. I see. <laughs> I do. But I did, couldn't do it any other way. You know, I wasn't ever trying to go for sensationalism. I just told the truth. Yeah. I keep up with the title before I ever put a word on the page. Apparently, and, there were ways. <laughs> and why, uh, why is it titled that? Well, I came up with that expression. I was in Hazleton. So a lot of the books about my alcohol and drug abuse. I know, get in line. Um, but it was the 80s. I mean, it's recently been written, but I do write quite a bit of things. I write about all the complaints about my life. But when I was in Hazleton, there was a lot of scandal. Um, and Barney and I, Barney was going through a divorce. Um, the press was terrible to us because we were very hot at that time. And this was our secret. And... We had fallen in love with each other, and we knew it was wrong, and we couldn't help it, and we kept it a secret from Tyne for a year, which is inexcusable. Because Tyne and Barney and I were a triangle. Nobody could, you know, break us up, and this was something she didn't know about. Eventually, we told her. Um, but it was just a horrible, horrible time. Anyway, I ended up in Hazleton, which is the harbor of the Reaps. And um, it was all over the press. It was awful. And Cagney uh, certainly was the first alcoholic in a series on television. And um, it turns out, so is Sharon. So it was a lot of his life imitating art. Was she loaded when she did those amazing scenes? And boo, boo, boo. I was not, by the way, I cannot drink and perform. I'm not that good. Um, timing's everything for me. So somebody approached me when I got out of his It's a four-week program. I was there seven weeks. Hi. Seven weeks. <laughs> they just couldn't. <laughs> yeah, like you're, yeah, you're going back to one. <laughs> back to one. <laughs> Honest to God. And I was very well known in those days. So they used to hide me. They'd hide me uh, like every Sunday was parents day to come and see whoever they loved that was in Aislinn. Uh They hide me in the infirmary because we were saying Sharon Gress does not live here. They were trying to protect me. So this girl says, you were in Hazleton? I said, yeah. She said, what were you doing in Hazleton? I said, apparently there were complaints. <laughs> 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 you know i always try to make light of any tragedy uh, and barney having him standing next to me we weren't married but he burst out laughing and if he burst out laughing i know i did something for me yeah and it's just always been my expression no matter what terrible thing happens apparently there were complaints it's such a great line <laughs> it really is, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah yeah, it was painful at the time. Yeah, it's, it's like, this is what we used to, you know, when I was a kid and we watched MASH, we'd like, oh, it's like MASH. 
you laugh in order not to cry. Yeah, that's right. I love that. I love that. That was a good show. That was a great show. Mm-hmm. I'm oh so sorry that you included me in this trilogy, which I believe is about to be a quartet, if you get Karen in, right? Yes, yes. We All right, so we are now down to three questions. What's the 80s ladies-driven television show that resonated with you at the time or afterwards? We usually ask us not to name their own show, but... You know, a lot of people were busy in the 80s working on their show. So is there an 80s ladies TV show other than Cagney and Lacey that resonated with you? No. Okay. No. Was there another 80s ladies television show? No. Absolutely <laughs> not. like not. Cagney and Lacey. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not being coons. I'm just, it, was there? Um, I, there, I, there well, well we're, we're doing a whole podcast about them. So. so when you're shooting your own show, you don't get a chance to watch other people's work. I'll tell you who my favorite ladies TV show is. Now, um, please. Hacks. Oh, we love Hacks and we love Jean Smart because she was a famous ladies of the 80s and designing yeah, women. She was, but I never got to see, I became friends with, um, oh God, the two, the two brunettes. Um, Delta, Delta Burke. Burke. Delta Burke. Yeah. Jinx. Delta Burke. Yeah, Dixie Carter. Is the other Dixie one. Carter. I only knew Dixie and Delta. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Tiki Kofi. But I never got to know the other two women on the show. But, so, Hacks with Jean Smart is a piece of genius. And she plays a woman of her age. So, it's like being in the 80s. I mean, to me, she's just a absolutely brilliant down-to-earth broad and the writers that show are brilliant and it's about a woman who is fading and doesn't want to and if i think this everything i'm learning about this show is true she's not about to fade she's absolutely my idol again i don't watch a lot of tv but then I got to be introduced to Jane's bar in this part. Phenomenal. Yeah, Style and, and substance. And that's actually the second question. Um, what, you know, female driven show of today um, would be your current favorite? So hacks. Hacks. Okay. And I think you already answered this question, which is what's like the most television or scripted moment that you've had in real life? Um, there was a moment in my life that I would have believed if I'd seen it in a movie. And it's in my book. It's just about my flying from Phoenix to Los Angeles. I had finally admitted for the first time in my life at age 26 that I wanted to be an actress. I never told anybody. And I'd wanted it all my life. I worked behind the camera all my life. I was a production assistant, production secretary. I was challenged. Sure, what do you want to do with your life? You have nothing to show for it. And I said the words out loud. That my step grandma was saying, just say it. It doesn't matter if you can have it. Just say it. That must be something you want. I said, I want to be an actress. She said, so? I said, well, Mary, 26 years old, a little old, I'm starting. And she said, when I was your age, I was under contract to MGM. I said, you were? She said, I was. I wasn't very good, so it only lasted a year. But anyway, the evening goes on, and she said she would not tell my grandfather, because my grandfather disapproved. My grandfather was a very big showbiz lawyer. She promised she wouldn't tell him. Next morning, your grandfather would like to see you. (laughs) (laughs) He said, that's ridiculous. I go, earn something to his bedroom. That's ridiculous. I said, well, I knew you'd say that, Grandpa. That's why I asked Mary not to tell you. And he said, I mean, it's ridiculous. You think I'd stand in your way? I said, oh. He said, you want to be an actress? I said, yes, crap. He said, so what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to take lessons. He said, great. How much are the lessons? He knew I didn't have a penny. I said, they were, I can't remember what they were. It's in my book. Let's say it was 500 but it wasn't. Uh, I think it's like $50 for three months. He said, you got $50. Now what? Said, 
Right? But there was so much money, you guys. You have no idea. I had nothing, nothing. And he said, so you want to go home now? I said, no, Grandpa. I came to visit you for two weeks. You invited me. He said, I know I did. You want to go home now? My grandfather was a thoroughbred racer. He trained thoroughbreds. He bred them and he raced them. And that day, he saw a filly who was ready to run. Now you have this money. You take this class. And what are you going to do while you're? What are you going to do while you're waiting to be an actress? I said, I'll get a job. I'm a secretary. He said, Fine. Have Mary get you a ticket. Go home tonight. I just gotten there the day before. This moment I want to tell you about. I'm flying to Arizona into Los Angeles, my home. And I'm looking out the window, and I knew I would not fail. I knew I wasn't a looker. I knew I wasn't young. And I looked out over Los Angeles as I was landing, and I said, this is where it happens. I will not fail. And I knew I wouldn't. And a year later, I was under contract to the biggest television studio in the world. And I'd never acted in my life. And you lasted more than a year. Yeah. That's awesome. That is a beautiful story. Yeah. Awesome. And a beautiful moment. And we yeah. just can't thank you enough for agreeing to do this and being a guest on our podcast. It, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's been an amazing conversation. And thank you, ladies. This was an honor. This is me being sincere. Uh, this is a, it was an honor to be on your show. Thank you very much. You're so Thank welcome. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Our audiography for today is two websites and a book. The Sharing Glass official website is at sharingglass.com. And the Facebook page is facebook.com slash official Sharon Glass. The book, of course, is Apparently There Were Complaints by Sharon Glass. You can find these links on our own website, 80stvladies.com, as well as where to go watch the shows that Sharon was in. Season two is right around the microphone. Tell us what 1980s email-driven television shows you think we should be talking about for our next season. And be sure to join in for our next episode. We will be interviewing the first woman to win an Emmy for directing, Miss Karen Arthur. She won in 1985 for, you guessed it, Cagney and Lacey. As always, we hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. 